everyone on Facebook. It's Steve Barrett here, Editor-in-Chief of PR Week. We are about to record our weekly podcast. And, uh, yeah, we're in uh, the studio with our fantastic guest from the UK, Danny Rogers, PR Week's UK Editor-in-Chief. How are you doing, Danny? Hello, Stevie. Good to see you. Good yeah, to be here. Good to see you, mate. Living the dream as usual. Frank Washcook's here, listeners. Our regular stalwart stepped in last week. I heard he did an impression of me. So no, let us no, let I, us know what you thought of that I on dare. Facebook. I couldn't imagine. <laughs> I heard you try to in- imitate my intro. No, I, I would is have. That, is I that would have failed true? miserably. Is and that I a, been uh, able to an ugly rumor? Okay. I would not have been able to pull it off. All right. Well, we're going to find out what's been going on this week. Another busy week in politics and communications, and we'll get a, a flavour of the UK and European market. Um, so yeah, if you've got any comments, please post them below. Try and keep them nice and friendly. And, um, yeah, we're good to go, so we'll start recording. Hello and welcome to the PR Week, PR Week's regular weekly roundup of everything that matters in the worlds of PR and communications. My name's Steve Barrett. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of PR Week, in the US, that is, because we've got our special guest here from the United Kingdom, Danny Rogers, PR, PR Week's UK Editor-in-Chief. How are you doing, Danny? I'm very good, Stevie, yeah. Good to be here. It's good to have you in New York. Good to have you stateside. I'm a bit jet lagged, but I'm keen to be. You're always jet lagged, mate. Come on, you've been here yeah, since. I feel jet lagged when I'm in England. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Just like Manchester United's players in Sunday's game, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, and Frank Washcook is our news editor, yeah, the stalwart for of the me. show. How are you doing, Frank? I'm well. <clears throat> Feeling a bit outnumbered all of a sudden. Are you going to be uh, podcasting in the style of Steve Barrett this week, or, oh, I, or in the style I, of Frank Washcook? I wouldn't dare, Steve. <clears throat> no, of course not. Um, yeah, we've got a busy week. We'll chat up, chat with Danny about the UK market and stuff going on over there. Big uh, move, Johnny Watter. He's retired from, well, he's retiring from IBM and Ray Day's taken over. We'll find out about that. Uh, big change at Verizon in terms of personnel. Interesting uh, development there. There were some elections on Tuesday, which uh, we all stayed up late to watch. Um, we'll, we'll find out what uh, happened there and what that means. Uh, Twitter, you can now... Wax lyrical for 280 characters, not just 140. So President Trump will be even more effusive on Twitter. And he's still getting through, even in China. So uh, we'll find out about that. And anything else that catches our attention over the next 25 minutes? Let's see how it goes. We've got a great guest, so it could be a longer show this week. So, Danny, what are you doing in America? Anything interesting? you I've been giving some lectures at Boston University to uh, grads and undergrads on their communications course. It's the oldest communications course in the world. Did you know that? I Set up in the did, 1940s. I might have known that. Yeah. I have been up there, yes. Ray Kotcher is a Ray sort of one visiting of the professor up there. Ray formerly yeah. of Ketchum. And uh, no, it's a very impressive setup they've got there. They've got thousands and thousands of people studying PR and journalism. They have. And you um, were doing some case studies based on your book. Do you want to get a plug in for the book, Danny? I, I think it's. <laughs> Hard, hardly worth it. It's been out two years now, Steve, but it's called Campaigns That Shook the World, <laughs> The Evolution of Public Relations, available at all good bookshops, well, Amazon, Amazon anyway. <laughs> yeah, check it out. It's a good read, and uh, Danny updated the case studies for the, for the students, so I hear. Yes, and, uh, yeah, we talked a bit about Mr. Trump and, um, and also some of the uh, corporate campaigns over the past year, such as Fearless Girl, which, of course, took Cannes by storm this year. It did. It did indeed. So tell us a bit about the market in the UK at the moment. Obviously, Brexit is high on the agenda and has, seems to have been forever. Give, give the US listeners a bit of an update on where that's at and what impact that's going to have on business, or, e- or even if we know yet. No, we probably don't know. The um, Brexit is having a, a gradually damaging effect on the on the British economy I think and um, but somehow for PR it appears to have given PR a boost in the short to medium term in that so many companies now are thinking of relocating elsewhere in Europe <laughs> that they need a lot of um, a lot of consultancy uh, in terms of communications and, and other consultancy so in the short term I think it's probably boosted public affairs and corporate affairs um, but I think in the long run it'll hit uh, the marketing communication side of things because the uncertainty is starting to have a, a detrimental effect. 
Yeah, and you hear of UK consultancies actually advising US clients on what Brexit means potentially for their businesses as well. So they, they seem to be getting a bit of consultancy and, and work over here too. Do you think eventually that might impact some of the he locations of the PR and marketing firms? Do you think they might move their you know, European HQs from London maybe somewhere else in Europe eventually? It's a, it's a possibility. That's what the, the banks are doing uh, at the moment. They're looking at um, establishing bigger bases in the EU rather than in, in London, just in case there are problems with trading with the EU if they're outside it. Um, and I think there will be a shift by other forms of, of business and consultancy as well. PR may be, well be one of those. Mm. So how long is this going to take? Because there, there is a deadline, isn't there? Isn't yeah. there a two-year two deadline by which yes. this is meant to have happened? It doesn't seem to be making much progress. No, it, the, the uh, talks have become a bit um, delayed. The deadline is March 2019 for it all to be sorted out, but uh, there's a lot of brinksmanship going on in terms of negotiation with the EU. So uh, everybody's a bit worried on our side of the pond, Steve. And you seem to have a bit of a lame duck Prime Minister, Theresa May, and nobody really wants to, there's no profit in anyone stepping in into her shoes until this whole Brexit thing is sealed, is, is there? No, it's, um, Brexit has divided the government in the UK, um, but it's had a lot of other problems as well. Uh, one of the most disastrous uh, political election campaigns of recent <laughs> times. And uh, I don't know if you saw the Theresa May speech at the party conference did, where yeah. uh, just about everything went wrong that could have gone wrong. So she I got think attacked by, well, not attacked, but there was a protest. There was wasn't a stunt there? who held up a P45, which signifies unemployment in the UK. And, and she, um, she had a coughing fit. Or, or she yes, and then the, um, the backdrop, the letters started falling off the backdrop as she was, <laughs> as she was speaking. So uh, <laughs> it was all a bit of a shambles, as we would say in, uh, in England. Yeah, if you think back to David Cameron, he really made his name at the Tory conference, didn't he? He did that famous yeah. speech with no notes, sort of very natural, great presenter, and it really sort of, cemented him as the leading I don't think he was even leader then but it cemented him as the leader of the party and, and actually paved the way for him to finally be, to eventually become Prime Minister so yeah, they're the, very important those conferences Well the modern they? history of uh, British Prime Ministers we've had some very good communicators you know we've had um, Tony Blair and we had uh, You're talking David, about Gordon Brown there? Well we, we, we <laughs> sort of glossed over the several years of Gordon Brown who recently <laughs> brought out a book actually one of the statements in the book uh, that Gordon Brown wrote about his time as um, Prime Minister was that he underestimated the the power of communication. Yeah. It was one of the things that stopped him from being a professional Prime Minister and um, the same could be applied to Theresa at the moment perhaps. Yeah and you could say that Brown was a far more credible politician than Tony Blair, but Blair was just a consummate front man, wasn't he? And he was Quite, very, very yeah. slick in that respect. So yeah, and I think Obama, you know, cut, was cut from the same the same cloth, really. Yeah, it's such an important part of modern politics, isn't it? And um, even Trump, in his own way, has certainly has a way of influencing yeah, his an, core, doesn't he? Yeah, he's an entertainer, isn't he? <laughs> yes, indeed. Whereas Hillary never, frankly, never really caught people's... Uh, I don't know, what do you think, Frank? Well, I, I've always been in the camp that she was so staged managed in a lot of ways that when she actually and I think you saw this in the debates last year that when she actually was saying what she was thinking at the time and wasn't as rehearsed she connected with people a lot better than mm. she did in a very very rehearsed way you know where sometimes you would look at her on stage and and feel like everything's been through nine different focus groups before she said it yeah. uh, she, when she was natural she was um, a, a much better retail politician than when she was otherwise yeah then we'll pick up on US politics when we get into the discussion on the news because it's been election week this week Danny you're a big sports fan and um, for your sins you support that uh, horrible team from West London Chelsea I think you're um, fan of the champions the reigning <laughs> champions of, um, of Britain yeah blah 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 um, and uh, you had you managed to beat my team on Sunday, uh, Manchester United. Um, but um, well, that's a long-term strategy, by the way, just to keep your manager in, in, in a job. Because he was, as you emailed me last week, there was many much talk that it was going to be his last game, wasn't it? Yes, it's the way that uh, Chelsea Football Club tends to be managed, actually. It uh, keeps the managers on their toes, shall we say. But you've been doing a sports podcast, haven't you? Tell us a bit about that and, and, and how big the sports and entertainment business is becoming in terms of communications in the, in the UK. 
Well, partly it's, uh, it's a personal passion of mine because uh, although I support Chelsea, I do love football <laughs> and um, I love all sorts of sports. And so, but also professionally, I think sports has become such a big business. I think the States has always been ahead of, of Europe in terms of the sporting franchise and the sporting business, but I think we're starting to catch up now and most... Uh, of our sports are now big global properties and um, they're on the front page of the of the newspapers as well as the back pages these days. Yeah, that's true and you certainly think Manchester United having global owners, American owners, they brought a lot of big business sensibility, brought a lot of other things that we won't talk about but they, they have definitely improved the commercial awareness and, and the type of deals that they're doing. Frank, you're an Everton fan, aren't you? <laughs> well, no, no, really, no. Uh, not since Tim Howard left, anyway. Oh, so, okay. You know, yeah, the uh, man with the big beard. The man with the big beard. Yeah, and, and yeah. Is everyone in the U.S. gutted that you're not going to be in the World Cup next year? I'm going to follow it. time for a while. I'm, I'm going to follow it anyway. Because I, I sort of, uh, I enjoy watching the big blue chip companies, uh, countries, if you will, play each other. You know, I mean, if does that include England or maybe not these days? I, uh, <laughs> reputationally, it does. Performance wise, I guess we'll see. So, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. but like if a Spain is playing in Italy, I think it's a, it's a big deal and I enjoy watching it. And I, I think in terms of high stakes, there's not a lot that comes close to it. So it's a lot of fun to watch. It's a lot more fun if the U.S. is playing. Sure. Uh, so, yeah, I'm a bit disappointed. Yeah, it's, um, it, I mean, like when I was in Brazil for the last World Cup and there were more U.S. fans there than any other country. So um, that I'm not sure that, uh, as, as many would have gone to Russia, but um, the, the, the tournament will definitely miss the States. Are you going to pick up on the World Cup in the podcast? Have you done that yet or is it a bit early? It's a bit early yet. We've covered um, rugby, cricket, the NFL and the globalization of sport. Uh, one of the best podcasts we've done is looking at... Um, the phenomenon that is fan TV, fan television, mm. uh, football fan TV in, in the UK, led by uh, Arsenal. Um, it's about the only thing they are leading in. That's the right, moment, it's the it? only thing they're actually <laughs> successful in. But um, they are, you know, some of these, uh, these fans who do uh, YouTube shows every week are pulling in tens of millions of, of subscribers in some cases. Yeah. And um, I think the established broadcasters are actually struggling to compete yeah. with the engagement that the fan TV gets. Yeah, is, that a, is that a thing over here, Frank, in US sports, like fan TV for NFL? It's or? getting there, but I, I don't feel I it's as, as, as developed. No. I, I think that if you, if you follow your NFL team, for instance, there's a lot of video on their home pages, but yeah. I, I don't get the sense that it's as developed as it is with soccer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Danny, I was meaning to ask you, what, what is the view of the NFL uh, in in London now, considering they're playing three games a year over there now? Yes, I mean, we, um, we're we aware that the NFL seems to be visiting the city with uh, increasing frequency and mm -hmm. um, playing at amazing venues like Wembley Stadium and Twickenham Stadium. Um, it doesn't seem, to, if I'm honest, it doesn't seem to be cutting through to the sort of public consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, if anything, I think the biggest stories in the NFL are, have been the, you know, the stories about... Um, you know, you know, protests against racism and concussion and some of these more perhaps negative stories about uh, American football. So, um, yeah, it's an interesting one. Do you think that a, a team playing in London full-time would be well-received, that it could make it, or not there yet? I don't think we're quite there yet. Mm. Um, it would be an interesting experiment because you'd certainly, you know, you'd flush out the, who was real fans in, in the UK, but um, I, I think that's some way off. Yeah, there's we, some we had a British league for a while. Um, there were the London something or others versus yeah. the Sheffield mm. something or yeah. others. So there's but some debate happening here now in that uh, one of the issues with the London games is that the NFL isn't sending its best teams all that often. You know, yeah. I mean, for Green Bay has never played over there. I think Dallas has never played over there. So it, it's kind of rare for the better teams to get over there all the time, whereas Jacksonville's over there twice a year, it feels like. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think there's always been a core following for yeah. NFL since the mid-'80s when it first came in with The Fridge. Yes. Remember him? That William The Fridge Perry, um, Chicago Bears. That was, uh, we all stayed up to watch him uh, pile drive over the line. Um, but I don't know if it has crossed over into a more you know, generalist mm -hmm. crowd, to be honest, in the way that maybe soccer has over here. Though one of the, um, the things that came out of the podcast we did on the NFL was empty stadiums are a feature over here as well. Mm. Um, you know, we, we saw quite a few images of half-full stadia in, in uh, at NFL games 
Um, so uh, at least, I guess, the London ones appear to be selling out mm -hmm. at the moment. Yeah, Frank, uh, NFL viewing figures are down quite significantly they, this they season. Are. Is that because and there's of some the Yeah, protests? there's some debate about what that is due to. And there's, there's one school of thought that it's because of protests or at least driven a bit by the protests. There's another school of thought that the, the hurricanes at the beginning of the season had a, had a bad effect. Uh, on the viewership as well. Um, they were also down last year when the protests weren't as prominent of, uh, of, a, of an issue. So um, I think a lot of people think the protests are having some effect. I think the question is how big of an effect they're actually having. Yeah, yeah. Danny, um, you just had your uh, PR Week UK awards. Are there any other trends or types of work that you're seeing in the UK or Europe that uh, you know really stand out and maybe that that would be interesting to the US um, crowd? Well, as I said earlier, the uh, corporate and public affairs uh, sectors are particularly buoyant at the moment. And a lot of that work seems to be picked up by uh, medium and small uh, PR consultancies, uh, specialist PR consultancies, in particular areas of public affairs. So that's a, a buoyant area. I do think, actually, sports and entertainment is... Um, is quite lively in the UK at the moment. And in fact, at the awards, we gave our Hall of Fame uh, induction to uh, a legend of the entertainment business, Alan Edwards. And yeah, uh, you had Roger Daltrey. Though, we had you, Roger Daltrey, the, Who, the yeah. lead singer from The Who, on stage wow. presenting this particular award, which was um, uh, lifted the evening somewhat. Sure. So, um, but entertainment, you know, because the ability for PR companies now to produce content directly on behalf of their entertainment clients without going through traditional media is really having an impact, I think. Yeah, definitely. Um, um, I can't have you here without asking you about Bell Pottinger. I mean, I was at the awards last year and Tim Bell was on stage. I don't know if he was getting the award or giving the award um, to um, Lord Chadlington. Um, but uh, yeah, what's, well, now the dust has settled on that. Um, what's your take on it and what does it mean for the industry? Has it changed the way people perceive it or is it, or is it seen as a one bad egg or you know, what, what's your take on it? Well, Bell Possinger and the collapse of Bell Possinger without a doubt has been the biggest story in the PR industry in Britain over the last, um, over the last year. I mean, the fact that it was the 11th biggest consultancy uh, in our country and then went into administration, bankruptcy as you would say here, uh, within a matter of months is pretty incredible. Um, it certainly put public relations on the front page of the newspapers for a while, but for all the wrong reasons. It's always the case, isn't it? It's the only uh, time it is on the front And I think page. PR got a lot of criticism uh, in the short term by, by the media saying, you know, is this typical of a PR company that is running sort of fake news and fake Twitter accounts in, um, for, for dubious clients in South Africa? But actually, it has emerged as very much a, an outlier. Um, it, has be, it was quite quickly uh, expelled from the um, trade body in the, in the UK. PRCA, yeah. uh, in fact, that was one of the things that uh, accelerated the, the company's demise. And I do think, actually, it was a good warning that if you're working in PR consultancy, you should be ultra careful about who you work for and the sort of methods that you employ. Otherwise, you may cease to exist. So I believe that it's probably good for the PR industry in the long run in that it's, you know, it will clear it, clean up any bad practice there is. Yeah, a bit of a warning sign. Um, and if the people who work there, you know, the ordinary practitioners, have they found jobs? And what do you think the the future is for the senior executives of that, that firm. Are they kind of finished in a sort of uh, Kevin Spacey type way or are they, have they got a future ahead of them? Uh, I wouldn't like to make the analogy with <laughs> Kevin Spacey at this particular point in time, but um, th there's a few individuals uh, who are still very much out in the cold. The vast majority of Bell Possinger's 200 staff have been snapped up quite quickly by other consultancies. In fact, one public affairs corporate consultancy called Pagefield hired uh, 15 to 20 Bell Pottinger staff and set up a separate division. So I think there is a sense that there was some malpractice at Bell Pottinger, but the whole culture wasn't necessarily rotten and there's some good people to, um, to hire. Yeah, okay, interesting. Thanks for that. Um, let's pick up on some news stories, Frank. Um, John Iwata, who's, yeah. you know, often regarded as the most 
Uh, he was number one on our power list in the past sure. and, you know, has been held up as an example of a modern communicator, also looked after marketing. But he's uh, retiring from IBM and, and another very high-profile communicator is taking his place. That's right. It's sort of one heavyweight for another. Uh, next month, John Iwata is stepping down after 34 years at IBM, which is quite a career. And he is going to be replaced by Ray Day, who, of course, is the former Ford uh, Global Head of Communications. Yeah, interesting stuff. Um, it'll be interesting to see what Ray does in that role. And, um, yeah, well, I don't know if John will, when they say retire, I mean, I, I'm sure he'll do other stuff. He's uh, very well regarded, and right. uh, but we look forward to seeing what he does. And congrats on a great career at IBM. Um, and Verizon, they have a new, <coughs> oh, excuse me, senior communicator. That's right. and that's. I'll uh, let you pronounce their name. Well, uh, that's Mariana Agathoclis, and she's the new corporate comms VP over there. Interestingly, she has the role that used to be held by Tarad Neptune before he went to Lenovo and oversaw one of the biggest uh, technology pitches in the U.S. He did, and uh, that, uh, the result of that pitch was broken by PR Week that's in the right. U.S., wasn't it? So right. uh, uh, that was a great result for Zeno. Quite surprising, actually. Yeah, I think they them. turned a few heads with that. They did, yeah. Well, they were up against Weber, and uh, Tex 100 was the incumbent. And uh, I think Omnicom PR Group threw the full weight of that mm -hmm. operation behind it. So it was a good win for Zeno. And interesting that uh, Zeno's parent company, well, not parent, but sister agency, Edelman, mm -hmm. works for HP, a and competitor Samsung. of uh, and Samsung. And Xbox. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> just observations. Um, tell us about the elections, Frank, uh, yeah, on Tuesday. So interesting uh, night, amazing. wasn't it? It was worth... Uh, Bit of bit of hope for oh. those who are a little bit left leaning. We're very down the straight down the middle at PR of Week. Of course, we're apolitical. But um, after a long period in the wilderness, it seemed like some sort of tide was maybe starting to turn. And I, I hear I was prepared to stay up until four in the morning again, watching the results come in. And lo, it was all wrapped up pretty much by nine p.m. Yeah, it so. was, wasn't it? And amazingly, Did you see looked, Tucker Carlson calling the result. No, I it's think he was he was talking about Hillary, wasn't he? he well, Something he called like the result of the Virginia. Race. And, right. Um, never have you heard a more hangdog uh, um, <laughs> presenter. <laughs> it was, uh, and Sean Hannity kind of uh, covered it in five words and then yes. moved on to something else. But anyway. So I looked at it and I was like, my God, look, the Democrats can walk and chew gum at the same time. That's, it's, they won two gubernatorial races. They absolutely should have won. Um, I'm being a little it's bit not cynical, as easy as course, it looks, but, though, you know, um, walking and chewing gum at the same time. Well, the Virginia race, what was really interesting about it was how many seats in their assembly that they took, which I think really blew a lot of people's minds. Nobody expected that. That's a long time been a, a Republican assembly, and they um, they almost took control of it. I think there are a few recounts going on, and it's still up in the air. So it's still up in the air, that count? Yeah. Okay. That is, um, I believe it could be tied if, if two of them go the Democrats' way. Um, Ralph Northam is going to be the next uh, governor of Virginia in a race that appeared to have been tightening towards the end, but maybe wasn't, after all. And uh, there's going to be a new Democratic governor of New Jersey, which is um, really interesting in that it was a, I wouldn't say a landslide, but a big victory over the pick successor of Will Chris Christie. Chris who, Christie be missed by the populace of Jersey? Well, he has a 15% approval rating, so I doubt he'll be missed <laughs> by many people. But uh, maybe talk radio, but that's about it. Um, and Dallas Cowboys fans. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, uh, I'm sure he might be not as often seen in that box as he used to be so yeah and what about we there were other interesting results like the first transgender yes um is it senator or well no it's sorry, not, it's interesting um she, still learning your US she is going system. to be the first state assembly person who is actually sworn in and seated to the role uh evidently there was another transgender individual elected to a state legislative position but was never actually seated. Right. Uh, so it's a historic result in Virginia. Interesting that she beat out somebody who was one of the most anti-LGBT people. Yeah, who was uh, behind that state. bathroom bill. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, quite a triumph there. Yeah, and, and we should say openly transgender because yes. nobody knows if there were there, were, there have been uh, incidences like that. But it was, a, it was a night like that where there was a gun advocate defeated mm -hmm. by someone whose child was killed uh, his, a, girlfriend. his girlfriend his sorry, girlfriend sorry yeah. was killed in one of these horrific shooting incidents and it was seemed almost you know i don't know not payback time but it, it 
it seemed like there was no. I think that's kind of fair. But it seemed very um, poignant and 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 almost like people were saying, "Yeah, we're not really happy with the, the way these right. all these narratives are playing out, and um, and we do want to see a change." So and, and a lot of diversity in the election too. And then uh, Hoboken elected a Sikh mayor, um, and um, I, I want to say a city in Wyoming elected uh, a mayor who is a refugee from Liberia. Yeah. So I mean a lot of uh, a lot of diversity in the results too. So is this just a normal midterm blip or do you think there's something more serious at play here that the Republicans need to be uh, thinking very seriously about? Well when the head of your party is the president and he has a 30 percent approval rating that has a drag on the rest of the party and I, I think that's part of what you're seeing. So um, in the past year there's been so much talk about you know the Hillary camp versus the Bernie camp and a lot of tensions at the top of, of the Democratic Party. And, and all the while, they've been out there saying, we're recruiting a lot of good people. We're recruiting a lot of people that want to run for office. They're good. They're professionals. They are, they're serious people. And I think that got lost in a lot of the talk about um, the 2016 election and divisions in the party and things like that. And it looks like what they were saying about it turned out to be true. They were recruiting a lot of viable candidates. Yeah. Um, Danny, what's the sort of uh, view from abroad, if you like, of the U.S. political scene? Well, I think we're rather caught up in the uh, Donald Trump soap opera. Um, you know, the various uh, investigations uh, over Russia, um, and it it's rather dominates the narrative we have about American politics. Mm. It's not a particularly um, accurate, uh, you know, picture of what's really happening over here, I think. And it's fascinating to hear you talk about what's going on at these, um, these latest elections, because clearly you get a much more textured view on... Um, on exactly what is going on, but uh, Trump just appears on our television sets every night saying something more and more outrageous. Mm. Well, of course, the UK has its own sort of Donald Trump type figure in Boris Johnson, doesn't he? With, uh, who made the uh, headlines again this week by, by well, seemingly putting in danger the life of um, uh, someone who's being held in Iran, I believe. Yes, this government is being hit by a number of um, resignations and scandals. There's, uh, in, the, um, in the wake of the Weinstein um, uh, scandal, there's been uh, sort of lower level uh, allegations in the British political world of, of sexual assault and sexual harassment. So um, it's certainly a government that feels under siege at the moment. Yeah. OK, um, let's finish on Twitter, because they've gone from 140 to 280 yes. characters. Is that going to change your world, Frank? No, not at all. <laughs> I'm going to stick to you 140. You just said that in 14 characters. <laughs> well, I have my mind made up. Um, <laughs> I'm of the camp that uh, 140 was enough, yeah. that it worked. And um, I, I think the biggest improvement they've made over the past couple of years was when they stopped counting the links and the photos and uh, things like that against the character count. I think once they did that, they were set. I don't think really 280 is all that necessary. Yeah. That's what about you, Danny? No, you're I, a big, I, are you a big tweeter? Uh, I am quite a big tweeter, actually. And um, there seems to be a bit of a consensus at the moment that maybe we've gone past peak Twitter mm. and that um, if you talk to influencers, certainly on our side of the pond, uh, they tend to favour these days Facebook and Instagram. Uh, so I think people who are big on Twitter are, are thinking about how to transfer their loyal following mm -hmm. across to another medium. That's possibly a bit unfair. Uh, it could be that Donald Trump has, Trump has actually helped Twitter. And, um, Certainly made it high profile, yeah, 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 for sure. But 140 characters is enough, let's face it. Yeah, so are you, you translating over to Instagram and Snapchat, Danny? I haven't got time, I'm too old. <laughs> All right, well, we've got some content on that, on how that's going to affect marketing, etc. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, Twitter it did post its first profit, though, didn't it, recently? Uh, no, but they're close. Oh, okay, they're that's close. right. They they're were about to turn the corner. Close to it. But, yeah. Um, yeah, but then they seem to shoot themselves in the foot every time they're getting close. But, yeah, um, and, and again, it's, I think a lot of people have these questions about why can't you get rid of the Nazis? I mean, <laughs> some of them are quite open and outspoken in their Naziness, and yep. they're easy to find. And that's you true. Know, so, I blogged um, about this last Friday, if you're yeah. interested, giving myself a plug for a change. Um, so check that one out. Um, okay, well, thanks, Danny, for guesting. Good nice to, to see here. you in town. Thank you, thank you, Frank. Don't forget our Hall of Fame, 
big night for PR Week, December the 4th, Monday, December the 4th, where we're uh, inducting our latest uh, group of six honorees. And we're also kicking off our 20th anniversary over in the US, which is in 2018, but we're going to launch that in December 17. And we are joined by the PR Council and the LeGrant Foundation, who are also turned 20 in 2018. So that's going to be a great night in New York. So we'd love to see you join us there and uh, come and celebrate the industry. It's a nice night. It's not quite as competitive as the awards nights. Everyone's very uh, con convivial, congenial, and uh, collegial, I think is the way to put it. Not quite. And uh, we just celebrate the industry. Um, we launched our brand film festival in the US, and uh, entries for that you've got until January the 22nd to get your submissions in. Great. Great uh, celebration of cinematic storytelling. Been a big, big success, and uh, do check that out, brandfilmfestival.com. And we've launched our Global Awards. They're going to be taking place again in London on May the 18th next year, and you've got until January the 15th to enter into those. So we're looking forward to seeing lots of great work. But that's all we've got time for. We'll see you next time on the PR Week. <laughs>